convinced that Hubbard was the returned savior and that his techniques and his knowledge and, and his majesty would eventually bring all mankind to an enlightened state and that was what we were doing. There were some things about him that I did feel were rather, rather dangerous. I fell so much under his spell that um, I told my roommate, if ever I told you I was going to marry this man, she should tie me up and not allow me out of the house. I was overwhelmed. Here I am in the presence of the, the most important individual in the cosmos. I mean, you know, this, is, this isn't just like meeting a film star or something. I'm meeting, I'm meeting God with plus signs. Lafayette Ron Hubbard created one of the richest and most controversial cults of our time, the Church of Scientology. He spent much of his later life at sea, on the run from those who accused him of being a crook and a charlatan. But to the millions who at one time or another followed him, and to himself, he was the greatest guru who ever lived. There is one thing you can say about Dianetics and Scientology, and I'm sorry if this sounds odd, but it isn't everybody who can write a book that turns the world on its ear. But more remarkable still was the story of Ron Hubbard's life. The story of a science fiction fantasist turned self-proclaimed messiah. Ron Hubbard was determined that from the start his life would be the stuff of legend. He was born in 1911, and told of how he was brought up on his grandfather's ranch in Montana, which, he said in a newspaper interview, covered a quarter of the state. As a small child, he was breaking broncos and hunting coyote. He claimed he grew up with old frontiersmen and cowboys, and even became a blood brother of the local Blackfoot Indians. These were all splendid tales. But all that is known for sure is that while he did used to visit the small livery stables his grandfather owned, he was brought up in an ordinary home, the only child of ordinary American parents. Towards the end of World War I, his father joined the American Navy, and the teenage Hubbard spent holidays in Guam, where the family was stationed. He traveled in China and the East. With a taste for adventure, he went prospecting for gold in Puerto Rico, and, as a student, even led a sea exploration to find pirates' haunts in the Caribbean. But he couldn't resist gilding the lily. A Scientology book later recorded his claim to have communed with native bandits in the high hills of Tibet. But there's no evidence he ever went to Tibet. He told so many stories of exploits of his in South America and the West Indies and places he would have to be at least 483 years old to have had enough time to have done all those things. But that doesn't really matter. I mean, it was just very entertaining, really, except that he turned it into a, into a religion. Even when he was a teenager, in his, in his diaries, he was writing little stories, you know, sea adventures and yarns, that sometimes the, uh, when uh, some of his own representatives found them, they thought these were true. You know, there was an escapade of him fighting an octopus that once his... Uh, one of his personal representatives was telling us this true story, and I tried to point out to her later, no, this is just one of his stories that he's interspersing with his private diaries. When he was 22, Hubbard married his first wife, Polly. They went to live on Puget Sound in Washington State, and soon had two children. Hubbard's joy in life was sailing and exploring, but now he had to settle down and earn some money. With such a prolific imagination, he became a writer, starting with adventures and fantasies for the Penny Dreadfuls. Then he turned to science fiction and became a bestseller. Two books, Final Blackout and Fear, were considered sci-fi classics. But Hubbard's most amazing story was about himself. His literary agent was Furry Ackerman, himself a sci-fi fanatic. One night, deep into the small hours, 
Hubbard told Ackerman of a bizarre event in a hospital theatre. It was an event that would shape his entire life. He said that he had died on the operating table. And he rose in spirit form and he looked at the body that he had previously inhabited and he shrugged the shoulders he didn't have anymore and he thought, well, then where do we go from here? Off in the distance he saw a great ornate gate. And it looked kind of interesting to him, so he wafted over to it and the, the gate, as they do in supernatural films, just opened without uh, any human assistance. He floated through, and on the other side, he saw an intellectual smorgasbord of everything that had ever puzzled the mind of man. You know, how did it all begin? What is God's purpose? Where do we go from here? Are there past lives? Are there future lives? And, and uh, like a sponge, he was just absorbing all of this esoteric information. And all of a sudden, there was kind of a swishing in the air and he heard a voice no no not yet he's, he's not ready and like a long umbilical cord he felt himself being pulled back 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 and he lay down in his body and he opened his eyes and he said to the nurse uh, i was dead wasn't i then uh, he bounded off the operating table i don't know how you die and the next minute you're bounding off an operating table he got two reams of paper and a gallon of scalding black coffee. And uh, at the end of two days, he had a manuscript called Excalibur or the Dark Sword. And he told me that whoever read it either went insane or committed suicide. And he said the last time he had shown it to a publisher in, in New York, uh, he walked into the office to find out what the reaction was publisher called for the reader. The reader came with a manuscript, threw it on the table, and threw himself out of the skyscraper window. But was Hubbard's extraordinary story true? Excalibur became the stuff of mystery. Hubbard told friends it was too dangerous to publish. But 40 years later, a treasure trove from Hubbard's early journals and manuscripts, believed to have been long lost, was discovered by his staff. There were two and a half versions of Excalibur. I read them and I didn't go mad and didn't die. They also include the information within related writings that these came out of a, a nitrous oxide incident. Hubbard had a couple of teeth extracted and it was while under the effect of nitrous oxide that he came up with Excalibur. Hubbard's death was in fact an hallucination under the effects of anesthetic. So what was the intellectual dish he'd fed on? It's not particularly revolutionary. The key to Excalibur was this uh, great realization by Hubbard of uh, survive as being the one command that all existence and all all life and all people have, uh, that became the basis for a lot of Dianetics and a lot of Scientology. This idea had a profound impact on Hubbard. In a letter to Polly, he wrote, I have high hopes of smashing my name into history so violently that it will take a legendary form. The Second World War brought a new dimension to the Hubbard legend. He said that while serving in the United States Navy, he'd been blinded, but that inspired by the insights he'd first glimpsed when he died on the operating table, he'd dramatically been able to cure himself. By 1948, through my own processing and use of the principles I had isolated up to that time, was able to pass a 100% combat physical, which was very mysterious to the government. How had I suddenly become completely physically well from being blind and lame? It was an odd story, because Hubbard's war record shows his recurring problem was a stomach ulcer.